once again just want to bring our thoughts to the fact that it is Christmas Eve today. Tomorrow we'll be celebrating the birth of Christ. Whether real or imaginary, uh, you know, historians will always like to say, oh, this wasn't the date mm-hmm. and that wasn't the date. But really it doesn't matter what date it was because we're not celebrating some, you know, child being born. Just like in the case of Krishna, the similarities we were talking about, their birth itself was so interesting. Both of them were being born um, while being hunted. Krishna's uncle Kants was, you know, will it right there waiting for Krishna to be born that he could kill him. Christ was in the process as he was being born. King Herod was killing all the children under the age of two, just with the hope that he can get to this Christ child. Both were born under extremely difficult circumstances. Krishna was born in a prison. Christ was born in a stable. He was born with the donkeys and the cows. His bed was what's called a manger where the animals would drink water out of. And both had to be immediately hidden and taken away. Christ to Egypt, Krishna to Vrindavan. And they were raised not really fully being able to express themselves. Yet, of course, the light can never be hidden. And this is important for us not to see from the perspective of, ah, their lives were such, but it's about the consciousness that they represent. And especially in the context of the Gita, where we're talking about the battle of life. Divine consciousness isn't just given a red carpet entrance, like, aye, chaliye, you know, come here, take over. Maya fights it tooth and nail. And even in the expression of the birth of this consciousness, whether Christ or Krishna, really, they're just the same. You see Maya bringing out everything it can, making it as hard as it possibly can for this birth to take place. And even in our spiritual journey, often you'll see as we begin to express greater and greater divine realities, the world begins to, in fact, turn on us. And not just from the outside, but from within, suddenly tendencies that we thought we'd overcome begin to come more strongly. Suddenly these feelings and confusions and doubts begin to assail us. That darkness of the soul is a simultaneous process as the light of the soul begins to grow. And that's what we're talking about here, whether it's Christmas, whether it's Janmashtami, whether it's the birth of any saint, any avatar, we're talking about consciousness is not so easily perceived and invited, so easily accepted, whether it's uh, the consciousness individually being born within us or whether it's this great consciousness of God being allowed to manifest in the world. We look around us today and in a sense, I can see a similar situation. You know, people are so scared and everybody's running around and everybody's at each other's throat. It's almost like the stage is set Mm -hmm. for some great power to not just come because this great power is manifesting. Maya is kind of upping its ante. And uh, sooner or later, of course, the light will triumph because, well, darkness cannot exist Mm -hmm. in the presence of light. But it's our job now to help participate in increasing that light. And we do that first and foremost by recognizing and allowing that light from within to shine. We don't need to look too far out for that light. We don't need to say, hey, Narayani, let your light shine. First, let's just work on our light. And when our light's strong enough, all those that resonate with that light they begin to be drawn to it and their light naturally gets reflected through yours. And that's how the world will be transformed. And that's how the masters are asking of us to transform the world today. So that's on a kind of macrocosmic (laughs) aspect of this beautiful conjunction of the day. We had a conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter and today we're having a divine conjunction of Christ and Krishna expressed through the Gita and expressed through Christmas. 
We're on chapter eight now. We just ended chapter seven, which was the yoga of knowledge and discrimination. And Krishna ended that saying to Arjuna. This is the last verse from the previous chapter. Those who perceive my presence within their Adi Bhuta, their Adi Devya, and their Adi Yagya bodies, their hearts united to me, retain their perception even at the time of death. So Krishna introduces these three really vast Adi Bhuta, Adi Deva, and Adi Yagya, these concepts. And as we ended the last class, we said, thank God for Arjuna, yes. because Arjuna is playing the part of the yes. disciple of the seeker. And so chapter 8 begins with Arjuna asking Krishna this question. Arjuna said, O best of the Purushas, Krishna, please tell me, what is Brahman? What is Adhyatma? What is Karma? What is Adi Bhuta? And what is Adi Devya? He goes on to then say, O slayer of the demon Madhu Krishna, slayer of that demon, that's what we're working on, isn't it? What is Adi Yagya? And in what manner is Adi Yagya possible in this body? How finally at the time of death are the self-disciplined to know you. So, Arjuna is setting the stage for us because we have no idea what Krishna is talking about. What's this Adi Bhuta, Adi Deva? Sometimes these words, um, intellectually, we may say, ah, I know what these mean, I've read them here and there, but what really is Krishna trying to say? What does it mean to, as he said previously, those who perceive my presence within there, and this is what Adi Bhuta Deva and Yagya mean, within their physical, astral, and causal bodies. So that's what Arjuna is asking now, Krishna. What, what are these bodies? What are you talking about here? I'm not quite certain. How is it that I am to perceive you in these three different manifestations? And then Krishna responds on verse 3. The blessed Lord replied, Brahman is the indestructible and supreme spirit. Adhyatma is Brahman's manifestation as the essential soul of all beings. And cosmic karma is Om, which causes the birth, sustenance, and dissolution of all creatures, and also the diversity of their natures. Let's stop here for a moment. What's also beautiful, um, celebrating this, the coming together of Christ and Krishna, is what Krishna is talking about here is a major part of Christ's teachings as well. What Krishna is talking, referring to here is also referred to as Om Tat Sat. The three aspects of creation, of manifestation, of, of essentially the three aspects of God. And Christ's teachings were of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is exactly the same as Om Tat Sat. And so Sat, which is what Arjuna asks in the beginning is, Krishna, what is Brahman? And that's what Krishna says. Brahman is the indestructible and supreme spirit. Now, you know, the mind is such that we can't really wrap our mind, you know, our heads around the concept of Brahman. But if we see it primarily and purely as consciousness, and that's what um, the Gita and all our scriptures tell us, God, as pure consciousness, separate from his existence, separate from all creation, puts a portion of his consciousness, that's how they say it, a portion of his consciousness, he puts it into motion. And that motion is the vibration of Om. In the Bible, you've got Christ explaining it as God is still waters. And upon those waters blows the word. And they use, of course, the word Amen, which is a corollary to Om. And so again, if you keep that image of this wind blowing over a still water, what does it create? It creates waves. And that creates the Om vibration as well. What's interesting is the way Krishna responds and says, what is Om? He calls it cosmic karma is Om. Now we understand karma as cause and effect, right? Whatever I do, that's what I'm going to receive. But essentially, karma is 
balance. Karma is duality. In order for consciousness to manifest and express itself as not just formless, not just vast, not just Satchitananda, not just pure bliss, in order for creation to happen, duality needed to express itself. And that first dualistic movement, that's the first separation from that still spirit, is Om. And when Om manifested, it was, it's like, it's like the absolute thoda sa uthavas from that stillness. And that thoda sa uthna created a crest and a trough, created an up and a down. The singular became dual. And then, as Om begins to vibrate more and more and more, and the frequency and the grossness of that vibration continues to move away from spirit, spirit being this central line, and the further we move from it, creation begin to manifest in all its elemental forms from ether to air to fire to water to earth. Not the elements as we understand them, you know, as a physical element, but this elemental quality of solidity, of fluidity, of purification and transformation, of expansion, that each of them, little by little, it's like from vapor to water to ice. You have these stages of solidifying spirit. And as spirit solidified, it became harder and harder to recognize spirit in that solidity. So now, once uh, water has become ice, it's like, this is how I relate to it as this little cube. I've forgotten that this very cube just hours ago was a flowing river. And I've forgotten that before that, this very flowing river was just water vapors in the, in the atmosphere. And then so on and so forth. And thus is how consciousness descended. So Brahman is that omnipresent, that vast state of being that's not really involved in creation at all. And we know that, right? It's not like all of us are involved in everything that we do. There's so many dimensions to us. There's so much of us, even as I'm moving my arms, there's a part of me that's just doing com something completely different, is on a completely different wavelength. There are so many portions to our own consciousness. And so Krishna is essentially saying when he talks about these three the Adi Bhuta, the Adi Deva, and we'll get to exactly to that. But what he's essentially saying is, if we must perceive God, if you must perceive me, you have to perceive me in all different portions of your being. And that's where people get really confused because spirituality is either a mental thing or something to read about or something to feel. But it's, it's portioned out, it's separate. We don't see the very fact that many of us will fight and get upset over the, over the very fact that we're bringing Christ and Krishna together. It's like we want separation and we want portions to be held and boxes to be created. Who wants unity here? I want to establish that my way is right. My God is better. My consciousness is higher. And so on and so forth, Krishna is essentially saying, you won't perceive me that way <laughs> until you don't experience me in every aspect of your being, physical, astral, causal, your mind, your thought, your feeling, your action in every atom of your body until I am not omnipresent in you. How will you be omnipresent in me? And so he says, so that's the two things, right? We talked about Sat, Sat the Father. And when Christ came, he says, I came because my Father sent me. I love how he speaks of Brahman, of Spirit as his Father. Because when you come as the Son, and this is what, let me just get there so that we don't get confused these words, aren't they? Oh, Supreme Embodiment, where are we? The Blessed Lord replied, Brahman is the indestruct indestructible sp Supreme Spirit, Adhyatma, that's what I was getting to. Adhyatma is the Brahman's manifestation as the essential soul of all beings. So you've got Sat, Supreme Spirit, Brahman, the Father. You've got Om, or the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, which is a vibratory in nature, which moves the still spirit 
and from that movement creates duality, creates karma, creates cause and effect. Now every movement needs to be balanced out with the opposite side. So everything you put out into the world needs to be balanced out. And so karma keeps the wheels of creation well greased. And every action that we perform, every thought, any energy that's put out into the universe, however slight it is, immediately requires a response back from the universe in order for creation to hold. So karma is not some sort of punishment. Karma is just an auto-correcting system in this beautiful balance that the universe has to maintain in order for creation to sustain. And when you look at it that way, you see yourselves as an essential cog in this machine. Like, oh, my every movement requires the universe to respond to me, to readjust, to shape itself, just to maintain the overall balance. Whatever's happening in the world right now, everything that the universe is having to do in order to just maintain that universal balance. Because the karma is not individual. Karma is on all levels. We've got individual karma, we've got family karma, we've got uh, species karma, we've got community karma, we've got planetary karma, we've got country karma. And then so on and so forth. The entire universe has a karmic balance that it needs to create. And imagine it trickling down to your very thought and having to take that into account in maintaining galaxies. That's how powerful you are. <laughs> That's the responsibility Brahman has placed in your hands. But then Brahman's not just this oh, spacey thing out there separate and just looking at you and saying, ha ha ha, you know, phas gaya ab tum. Brahman then as Adhyatma, and this is the sun, as Adhyatma, Brahman's manifestation is the essential soul of all beings. Then Brahman placed himself in creation. And the way our Guru put it, he said, present in individualized in every atom of creation. And he says, that is why every atom in the entire universe is unique because it is a unique reflection of Brahman. And that is why each one of us with all similar parts are just so completely unique, so completely individualized, so completely our own expression of Brahman, propelled by Om and the karma that Om creates around us. And so this is where we're placed. And this is Christ saying, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and this is Krishna saying, Om Tat Sat. Sat is Brahman. Tat is individualized. The Kutastha Chaitanya, where Brahman is present inside you and inside every, absolutely everything. Nothing is not of him. Nothing is without him. Nothing breathes but by his grace. And that's the power that we're trying to kind of tune into. Yet in that, we want to create separation. We want Om to become so hard, so gross, so completely solid that we can no longer see Brahman in it anymore. And that's why Krishna is trying to tell us is that first seek it in form, then bring it up to the astral world where you feel the energy behind it all. Bring it up to the causal world where you can perceive it and perceive God in thought, in an ideational form, and then you will know me. You must know me on all three levels. O Supreme among the embodied Arjuna. I always say this, but I just love how Krishna and Arjuna interact. Um, kind of, what's the word? They address each other. You know, this is how Arjuna says, O best of the Purushas. O slayer of the demon Madhu, wouldn't it be lovely for us to come and say, <laughs> you who have gr uh, great willpower, O Rajesh of great willpower, O Anjali of an absolute sense of humor, O Krishna of a sweetness of your voice. I mean, wouldn't it be lovely to constantly remind each other of the greatness that we have already achieved and the greatness that 
just awaits us just there because Arjuna hasn't, isn't supreme among the embodied, but Krishna sees him as, oh, supreme among the embodied Arjuna. Adi Bhuta is the basis of physical existence. Adi Deva is the basis of astral existence. And I, the spirit manifested ideationally. Here Krishna is talking about himself as Krishna, not just as Brahman. Am Adi Yagya. Because any master who comes, he has to bring with him just the tiniest sense of an ego identity. Just to hold, just to say, okay, this is, you know, this is the body that I'm responsible for. But they don't get completely into the Adi Bhuta or the Adi Daiva. In the sense, they're not identified with their physical form. They're not identified with their astral form. They're just an idea. They recognize, it's like, I know Shurjo is an idea in God's mind. And I'm responsible for that idea. Swami Kriyananda said it in a beautiful way. He says, Swami Kriyananda is an event for which I am responsible. And that's how these masters see themselves. They don't see themselves. I am this body and I must do this. And I have this energy and I must use it. I am this idea that God thought of. But this idea has a role to play as well. So Krishna here is saying, I am that ideational reality, which is... That first separation we talked about, Om at its absolute subtlest, millimeters away from the stillness of Brahman, just ready to, like a wave, just ready to merge back into the vast ocean. And many of us are the waves that are trying to get us far from the ocean, trying to say, look at me, I'm this big wave, and aren't I important, and aren't I amazing? Yeah, so that's, that's the difference. Here Krishna is super important and super amazing, but his existence is barely just an idea. And our existence is this form and this muscle and these bones and my personality and the thoughts that I have and the great inspirations that I come up with every day. And that's the difference between the great ones and us. We think we're great. <laughs> and in truth, we're just, you know, a sack of bones at best. And those guys who are so great barely see themselves as existing at all, as separately existing at all. He who, this is verse 5, at the hour of death thinks only of me, enters unquestionably into my peak. Now this is where Krishna is kind of giving us a sense. Death for us is what? Death is a transition period, right? It's moving from Adi Bhuta, the physical existence, into Adi Daiva. Daiva is that that uh, the adobe of the devas, right? Heaven, as we would understand it, the astral world. And every time we're in any transition, where one form is flowing into another form, Krishna is trying to help us. I mean, he, we'll talk about death too because that's important. But every time that's happening, if we're able to tune into Krishna, our ability to become and merge with him, because this breaking of forms allows us a momentary sense of freedom that otherwise we don't have. And this transition is taking place not just when the body dies. This transition is taking place every moment. Because what's the real uh, death that we spoke about? Every breath is a birth and a death. Every inhalation is a birth. Every exhalation is a death. In fact, that's what birth and death is as well. The child, what does it do the first time? It inhales, it cries. And then at the time of death is that final exhalation. And in between, you've got multiple. But that's the, that breath, that inhalation and that exhalation, that's all that matters. And that exists for us in every moment. And that's why when we practice the techniques like Hong So, when we get into that egg, so went away. And then there's just that stillness before the hong comes in, before that inhalation comes in. If in that moment, that's where Yogananda said, that's where you can slip into super consciousness, right? As that exhalation ends and before the inhalation. What other transitions do we have in our lives? We've got day and night before you're going to bed. That's another. Be with Krishna as you're going to bed and then you're 
the chances of staying with Krishna as a permanent reality again increase. What other transitions do we have when we move from one activity to, do, to another? Do we take a pause to think of God? Or do we just, oh, here it is. I just finished my lunch. I'm off. Now going to do something else. We're just so busy moving from forms. Even death, birth and death for most of us is just another movement of one form to another. But Krishna is asking us to pay attention to that movement. And not just at the time of death. It's not time. It's not like, all right, I'll wait till my death. And at the moment of death, I'll think of Krishna and I'll unquestionably be with him. And that's a lot of people think that way. Uh, now I'm going to, you know, fulfill all the desires that I have. And towards the end of my life, oh, sannyas na, then that's when I will think of God. But who thinks of God then? By the time you've built up so many regrets and so many desires and so many hopes and dreams have been smashed and created, that's all you can think of. So when Krishna is saying that at the time of death, think of me and you will come to me, he doesn't mean in that very moment uh, for a second. If I ask you right now, think of Krishna right now. It's like your mind could think of Krishna, but in less than a second, it'll go somewhere else. The heart's already are hoping for something else. I mean, this is the part of the portions of our consciousness that Krishna is trying to address. We're just such a divided reality. We're not even just Shurjo, just Narayani. We're, we're totally, completely multiple thousands, perhaps billions of people trapped within one set of consciousness. And that's what Krishna is trying to address here. It's not enough to call out to me, it's not enough to sing my name, it's not enough to praise and worship me. You must perceive me on every level of existence in order to merge with me. And with that, let's take and let's bring our Gita class to a close, even though we just got to the fifth verse, but it was just helpful and important for us to see what in my life, what is it can, that I can be experiencing daily and what levels and how many portions of my consciousness truly are being mm, offered. And that's what Adi Yagya is when Krishna says, I am Adi Yagya. Adi is the original, the absolute. I am that complete self-offering. And how often do we practice that Adi Yagya in everything that we do? That's important. Whether you read the Gita, whether you don't, whether you've memorized every verse of it, whether you haven't, really doesn't matter. Do you practice in as often as you can, especially in these transitions? Do you move from place to place, moment to moment, breath to breath, day to night? Do you move in Krishna? Do you move in Christ? Or do you just move in yourself? Those are the questions Krishna is asking us to at least ponder and hopefully beyond ponder to act on it. I love the fact that you spoke of karma as a system of autocorrection. And now it's a very particularly important time to go through not just our lives, but throughout this year mm -hmm. and, and just introspect a little bit and see all the things that we have gone through and are still pending there because we don't have yet the awareness to autocorrect those thoughts, actions, tendencies, behaviors. And it's a serious thing. And perhaps we can start from today onwards, this evening, and take one day at a time what I did today that needs to be corrected tomorrow. And I think this is a wonderful way to go and walk on the spiritual path. If we can just walk and take one step at a time, one section of the day at a time, I love lunchtime because it gives me a moment to quickly introspect and go through my morning and how I felt, what was the energy I put out, 
what were the main interactions that, that I felt I could have done much better, but since my mind was half here and half there, I missed uh, opportunities to give the very best of myself to that person, to that activity. So at lunchtime, it's a perfect time for me to, to think and what are the actions, activities, thoughts, interactions that will help me to auto correct those actions or things that are still pending. So as much as we can um, put really the willpower, the energy and the intention, the sincerity, I would say, the sincerity to do always better. And forget if you didn't do as well as you wanted, because guess what? We are constantly be given opportunities for that autocorrection. So every hour, every day, every week, every month, every year is an opportunity. So don't think that you have wasted all your time because from just this very moment, the power that is in your hands right now can really change your destiny. All right, everyone, let's end as we usually do a Gita class. Because the Gita is so intellectually heavy in many ways, because these concepts, they're not light concepts. <laughs> Krishna presents them as, oh, this is what's going on, <laughs> just do this. But when we start going into it, we realize, wow, there's just so many layers. And mm. Krishna is really asking us, <laughs> asking a lot of us. So we always like to end our Gita class with just chanting Om, just letting that vibration, that subtle, immediate vibration that left the divine, left Brahman to create the karma that we are enmeshed in, just kind of tune back, unravel that thread back in the direction of Brahman and just let the mind relax in the process so that when we leave this class we're not just mentalizing and intellectualizing and thinking everything that we heard but that we've relaxed into everything that we've heard and we've assimilated it more as a vibration as a feeling as an encouragement as a yes I can do this so let's chant Om just feeling that, yes, I can do this. <laughs>